Hi guys, it's Mrs. Bachman. Um, we're going to be talking about Alexander Hamilton today. And in order to do this, you're going to need to have your chapter 11 up on your screen, which is this right here. If you don't have this downloaded already, you're going to need to go to the U.S. History website. You're going to go to the textbook page. And when that decides to come up, you're going to scroll down to where it says Unit 3. And it's going to be chapter 11 right here. You're going to download that. Or you can just open it from your screen. The other thing that you're going to need to have access to right now is your first political parties page. Um, we're talking about how the first political parties came to be. And if you remember from our vocabulary, a political party is a group of people that have similar ideas about how a government should work. And they're, um, they work together to try to get their candidates elected into government. So the first two political parties that we're talking about were essentially created by two early gentlemen named Alexander Hamilton. He's going to be this gentleman over here on the left-hand side and Thomas Jefferson. Um, let's read the instructions together. It says, read section 4, that would be of chapter 11, and write a response to questions 1 through 6 from the perspective of Alexander Hamilton. Then, read section 5 of chapter 11 and write responses to the questions from the perspective of Thomas Jefferson. Before we get started on that, I want you to write down the political parties that each of them belong to. Alexander Hamilton, I want you to um, type in or write down his political party, which is the Federalist Party. Now, the Federalist Party should not be confused with the Federalist um that we already talked about, which was the group of people who worked together to try to convince people to uh, ratify the Constitution. Um, these Federalists was uh, our first political party. Now, his opposition was Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson's political party was called the Democratic Republicans. Um, sometimes you're going to see them um, written as just the Republicans. However, in a in a lot of texts, you will see Democratic Republicans, and that is how we are going to refer to them to, um, in our classroom today. Now, once you have those two political parties written down, let's take a look at what we're actually going to be doing. We're going to be reading about Alexander Hamilton first. You're going to notice that each of these thought bubbles is in response to a question. So question one is, what is your view of human nature? What do you think about people? Alexander Hamilton is responding in his own uh, voice, which means that this is going to be first person, and you're going to be typing in or writing in I statements. The first one is already partially done for you, and it starts off with Alexander Hamilton saying, I believe that most people are basically selfish and, and we're going to complete that together. Um, and so you're going to be doing that for each of these questions. So let's look at these questions really quickly before we start to read. Um, so we just read the first one. The second one is, who should lead our country? Um, and I want you to start off your statement with, I believe that. Um, question three is, how strong should our national government be? Again, you're going to start off with, I believe that. On the back, you'll have question four. What is the ideal economy? And the word economy here means how the government makes its money, how the country makes its money. And Alexander Hamilton, again, will start with an I statement. Number five, is the establishment of a national bank constitutional? Uh, meaning, should we be able to create a national bank? We'll read about that here in just a second. Is it allowed under the Constitution? And again, why or why not? And then finally, should the United States ally itself or become friends with Great Britain or France? Why or why not? And again, all of those are going to start with I statements. I believe that. Now that we know what we're looking for, we're going to read about Alexander Hamilton. And so I want you to open up your chapter to chapter 11, section 4. And it's going to be on page... 209 for those of you guys who are using paper books. Now I'm going to be highlighting on here. You don't need to highlight your text. Basically I'm going to be highlighting the information that is important for you to know for your notes. So let's read chapter 11 section 4 together. Alexander Hamilton and the Federalist Party. George Washington's warnings um, about the rise of political parties did not stop the rise of political parties in the young nation. The Federalist Party appeared first during the debates over the ratification of the Constitution. Its most influential leader was Washington's energetic Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton. Personal Background Hamilton was born in the West Indies and raised on the Caribbean island of St. Croix.
When Hamilton was 13, a devastating hurricane struck the island. Hamilton wrote a vivid description of the storm that impressed all who read it. A few St. Croix leaders arranged to send the talented teenager to New York, where he could get the education he deserved. Once in America, Hamilton never looked back. Hamilton's blue eyes were said to turn black when he was angry, but most of the time they sparkled with intelligence and energy. With no money or family connections to help him rise in the world, he made his way on ability, ambition, and charm. George Washington spotted Hamilton's talents early in the American Revolution. Washington made the young man his aide-de-camp or personal assistant. Near the end of the war, Hamilton improved his fortunes by marrying Elizabeth Schuyler, who came from one of New York's richest and most powerful families. With her family's political backing, Hamilton was elected to represent New York in Congress after the war. Later, he served as a delegate from New York to the Constitutional Convention. View of Human Nature now, guys, the nice thing about headings is it gives you a hint as to what we're going to be talking about. And notice that our very first question is about his view of human nature. What does he think about people? So let's read. Hamilton's view of nature was shaped by his wartime experiences. All too often, he had seen people put their own interests and desire for personal profit above the cause of patriotism and the needs of the country. Every man ought to be supposed a knave or a scoundrel, he concluded, and to have no other goal in all his actions but private interest. Most Federalists shared Hamilton's view that people were basically selfish and out for themselves. For this reason, they distrusted any system of government that gave too much power to the mob or the common people. Such a system, said Hamilton, could only lead to error, confusion, and instability. So in this first section, um, we know what Hamilton thought about human nature because it says here, in our first political parties page, the authors of this page have done the beginning part for us, and it says, I believe that most people are basically selfish and, and so if we look here, we're going to find out that again, Hamilton's view of people was that they were basically selfish and out for themselves. And so I'm highlighting that there. You don't need to highlight yours. What I need you to do is to write this down here. And so I'm going to do that right now as well. And so I've completed that statement. And so now our text says, I believe that most people are basically selfish and out for themselves. So Hamilton did not really have a very positive outlook on life. Um, and again, the textbook says that that came from his upbringing and also from his experience in war. He did not um, feel like people really supported the war to the extent that they should have. Our next section is views on government. And again, our next two topics for our questions are who should lead our country and how strong should our national government be. So let's read about Hamilton's views on government. Federalists believed that the best people, the educated, wealthy, public-spirited men like themselves, should run the country. Such people, they believed, had the time, education, and background to run the country wisely. They could also be trusted to make decisions for the general good, not just for themselves. Those who own the country, said Federalist John Jay bluntly, ought to govern it. Federalist favored a strong national government. They hoped to use the new government's powers under the Constitution to unite the quarreling states and keep order among the people. In their view, the rights of states were not nearly as important as the national power and unity. Hamilton agreed. Having grown up in the Caribbean, Hamilton had no deep loyalty to any state. His country was not New York, but the United States of America. He hoped to see his adopted country become a great and powerful nation. This was a really strange time in our country, guys, in that even though America existed, people really did not think of themselves as Americans. They thought of themselves as Virginians, New Jerseyans, uh, South Carolinians, Georgians, uh, New Yorkers. Hamilton was unusual in that he was an immigrant. He didn't grow up in the United States of America. He didn't grow up on the continent. He grew up in the Caribbean on an island. And so he was one of the first people that really kind of took this idea of a united country to heart, which was pretty unusual. All right, so back to our notes. Our question is, who should lead our country? Now, if we look at our text, 
it says that Federalists believed that the best people, the educated, wealthy, public-spirited men like themselves, should run the country. So we're going to, I'm going to highlight that. And you are going to write it in to your notes. I am not going to write this for you because you can write this on your own. If you need to pause the video at any point because you need to write and I'm moving on without you, feel free to do that. That's not a problem at all. So again, who should lead our country? We have that information right here. Our next question in our notes is, how strong should our national government be? Now, Federalists favored a strong national government. They hope to use the new government's powers on the Constitution, under the Constitution, to unite the quarreling states and keep order among the people. And so we know that Alexander Hamilton, as a Federalist, favored a strong national government. We know that he hoped to use the new government's powers under the Constitution to, uh, to unite the quarreling states and keep order among the people. So again, you're going to be writing that. You can write that in your own words. But again, you need to write that on your own. I'm not going to type that in here for you. I believe that you can do that on your own. And again, if you need to pause this video so that you can write that information down, you're more than welcome to do so. All right, I'm going to continue on with our notes. Our next question is, what is the ideal economy? And again, if we take a look at our text, our next section is views on the economy. So views on the economy. Hamilton's dream of national greatness depended on the United States developing a strong economy. In 1790, the nation's economy was still based mainly on agriculture. Hamilton wanted to expand the economy and increase the nation's wealth by using the power of the federal government to promote business, manufacturing, and trade. Before this could happen, the new nation needed to begin paying off the huge debts that Congress and the states had accumulated during the American Revolution. In 1790, Hamilton presented Congress with a plan to pay off all war debts as quickly as possible. If the debts were not promptly paid, he warned, the government would lose respect both at home and abroad. Hamilton's plan for repaying the debts was opposed by many Americans, especially in the South. Most southern states had already paid their war debts. They saw little reason to help states in the North pay off what they still owed. To save his plan, Hamilton linked it to another issue, the location of the nation's permanent capital. Both northerners and southerners wanted the capital to be located in their section of the country. Hamilton promised to support a location in the South if southerners would support his debt plan. The debt plan was passed, and the nation's new capital, called the District of Columbia, was located in the South, the Potomac River between Maryland and Virginia. So, our next question is, what is the ideal economy? If we look at our text, we know that at this point in 1790, the nation's economy was based mainly on agriculture, which means farming. Now, that is not what Alexander Hamilton thought our country should be based on, though. Hamilton wanted to expand the economy and increase the nation's wealth by using the federal government to promote business, manufacturing, and trade. And so Alexander Hamilton really wasn't um, all up into this, you know, farming. Um, we should be doing, you know, just all farming stuff all the time. No, he thought that we should be using the federal government to promote um, you know, creating your own business, being an entrepreneur, making things that would be manufacturing. He thought that we should be trading with other countries. And so that is what he thought our economy should be based on. And so that is what you're going to need to put in right here. Our next question is, uh, is the establishment of a national bank constitutional? Why or why not? So let's continue into our next page and read about the National Bank. 
Next, Hamilton asked Congress to establish a national bank. Such a bank, Hamilton said, would help the government by collecting taxes and keeping those funds safe. It would print paper money backed by the government, giving the nation a stable currency. Remember, guys, during the Revolutionary War, where we had like 14 different kinds of money running around, and that was horrible for, for the economy. Hamilton said, no, 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 that shouldn't happen. Most importantly, the bank would make loans to business people to build new factories and ships. As business and trade expanded, Hamilton argued, all Americans would be better off. Once again, Hamilton's proposal ran into heavy opposition. Where in the Constitution, his opponents asked, was Congress given the power to establish a bank? In their view, Congress could exercise only those powers listed specifically in the Constitution. And if you remember from our vocabulary day, that means a strict construction. Hamilton, in contrast, supported a loose construction or broad interpretation of the Constitution. He pointed out that the elastic clause allowed Congress to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying out its listed powers. Since collecting taxes was one of those powers, Congress could set up a bank to help the government with tax collection. After much debate, Hamilton was able to get his bank approved by Congress. Once established in 1791, the Bank of the United States helped the nation's economy grow and prosper. And so our question again is, is the establishment of a national bank constitutional? Now, Hamilton did believe that it was constitutional, and he thought it was constitutional uh, because he believed in that loose construction of the Constitution, meaning that it didn't have to be listed um, exactly in the, um, the Constitution for it to be allowed. He believed that, um, that Congress had the ability to do anything that they considered to be necessary and proper. And collecting taxes was necessary and proper, and therefore creating a bank to help collect taxes would be important. And so again, you're going to need to put this in your own words. You don't need to write all four of those lines there um, where it says, I believe that, all right, he believed that it was constitutional. You need to explain why he thought it was constitutional. And then finally, question six is, should the United States ally itself or be friends with Great Britain or France? Before we read this, you might be thinking, well, obviously France. They helped us fight the Revolutionary War, and we had just finished fighting England, Great Britain. Why in the world would we want to be friends with them? So let's read about what was going on in Great Britain and France before we determine um, who Alexander Hamilton liked. So views on Great Britain and France. When the French Revolution began, Hamilton hoped that it would lead to the establishment of a free and good government. But as he watched it lead instead to chaos and bloodshed, his enthusiasm for the revolution cooled. What you guys need to know about the French Revolution was that it was sparked right after our revolution ended. When the French came to America and helped us to win the war, they were inspired by us receiving our freedom from a king, and they decided that they wanted to do the same themselves. However, in the French Revolution, they ran around willy-nilly, uh, doing things like uh, murdering people with guillotines. And so I'm just going to show you a picture of a guillotine. Um, this is the equipment that they used to actually murder just thousands and thousands and thousands of people in France. Uh, the wealthy people were... Um, Oops, sorry, let's get out of that. The wealthy people were rounded up. The rich arist aristocrats, the king and the queen even, were rounded up in France. Their heads were stuck in here. This blade would come down, and they were murdered by the thousands. That is not something that happened in America, but it did happen in France, and um, it, it led to chaos and bloodshed. And so now you understand why supporting France was not such an easy idea. So let's uh, keep reading about what was happening here. When war broke out between France and England in 1793, most Federalists sided with Great Britain. Some were merchants and shippers whose businesses depended on trade with America's former enemy. Others simply felt more comfortable supporting orderly Great Britain against revolutionary France. Hamilton favored Great Britain for yet another reason. Great Britain was all that he had hoped the United States would become one day, a powerful and respected nation that could defend itself against any enemy. 
And so the question is, should the United States ally itself with Great Britain or France? Um, Hamilton thought that we should ally ourselves with Great Britain. He favored Great Britain. Now, why did he favor Great Britain? Not only did he not like the fact that France was kind of going crazy, but he hoped that America would become like Great Britain one day. He he thought that Great Britain was everything that we would become one day. We would become a powerful and respected nation, which was something that could be said about England at this time. And so again, you're going to be putting that into your own words. And we are now done learning about Alexander Hamilton. Again, if you needed to pause the video at any of these points to fill in your notes, feel free to do so. And if you need to rewind and watch anything again, feel free to do so again. Next up will be about Thomas Jefferson.